Thank you very much, Imrana. Good morning. Um, okay, so uh, today I'm going to continue talking about uh, Fourier transforms and how they connect to the way uh, waves propagate and then doubt how that relates to things like resolution of uh, images. So, so just to remind you, uh, in 1D, if I have a function, some, some function f of x as a function of x, what Fourier theory tells us is that uh, this function is the same as something that is pretty boring plus something that oscillates slowly. Of course, there's a lot of intermediate steps, a continuum of them, plus something that oscillates faster, etc. So any, any function can be constructed by adding things that oscillate at different frequencies. That's what Fourier theory tells us. And they can be cosines or sines or combinations that are these exponentials. In 2D, we have the same thing. Ah, before I go to 2D, um, what do you think that uh, would happen, say, if uh, these things, for example, these uh, parts that start to oscillate very fast, if I block them, what would happen? What would happen to this function? Sorry. It, it, it would it would it would be truncated. You miss miss the the sharp detail. Yes. So so these because these are the things that very fast. They are the ones that contribute to things that very fast here. Well, this contribute to things that very slowly. So the fine detail is lost here. And notice that to, 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 to filter out these fast clear oscillating things, one thing you could do is take this, break it into these by doing a Fourier transform, then applying a filter that is multiplying by something, and then inverse Fourier transforming. What is another name for that, which is Fourier transform multiply inverse Fourier transform? There's another way you can do that without doing Fourier transforms. You can do a convolution, a blurring. So a blurring would have the same effect of removing some of the frequencies. So this is in one dimension. In two dimensions, it's the same thing. But now, rather than plotting this like this, I'm going to plot the function as uh, some, some distribution here. And now this is equal to something that is pretty boring plus something that oscillates, let's say, like this at some frequency plus dot dot plus something that oscillates much faster, etc. But it can be not only in this direction, it can only be, it, it can also be in, in this direction, so something that relates like this, that's sinusoidal, plus something that oscillates much faster. But I can also do in, in other directions, for example, I don't know, something like this, etc. So we have a continuum of possible directions of, of oscillation and frequencies of oscillation. And the same thing, if we block some of these, now it's a two-dimensional space, we get uh, different things. So to illustrate that, let me use this mathematical notebook. So these two gentlemen here are Augustin Frenel, uh, the guy who uh, proposed the mathematics, the first proposed the rigorously the mathematics of wave propagation. Uh, uh, of light as a wave, and this is Mr. Fourier. And let me take uh, Mr. Fresnel, and here what I'm showing is, on the right is Fresnel, on the left is the Fourier transform of Fresnel. And uh, you see that this looks like a star. There's, uh, there's a lot of detail here, a lot of structure, 
and then there's these two lines. Can anyone tell me why there's two lines there? Or it looks like a star? Uh, well, it turns out, sorry? Yeah, it turns out that here I'm using white as one, let's say, black as zero. And what I had to do to do the Fourier transforms numerically, because I'm going to use those numerical Fourier transforms, the, 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 the fast Fourier transform that uh, is, is good for numerics, and I had to do what is called pad with zeros. I'm going to show this in more detail in another uh, animation. So I put a bunch of zeros to the sides. So there's, there's a big square that is the boundary of this picture, where it's all almost one and then zero. And we have a big boundary between black and white here. Those abrupt changes along lines generate uh, a lot of structure in the Fourier transform in the perpendicular direction. So this edge here gives rise to this line here, like this edge and this edge. Well, this edge and this edge give rise to these lines. So for example, there's not many features that uh, Mr. Fresnel has, but this part of his face probably has to do with a tiny little line that is here in this direction. So, so the main features about Fresnel himself is, is all these dots around here. This is an artifact from the, 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 the square window that I'm using. Now I'm going to simul uh, simulate what happens if I were to do a Fourier transform, then block what is outside of a given circular region, an inverse Fourier transform. So if you look on the left, if I click here, all of a sudden you cannot see this all the way because there's a circle. I'm multiplying by a circle. And it looks more or less the same. If I keep bringing this down, so now it's all in a circle here. Can you notice something? He's starting to get blurry, doesn't he? Exactly. And, and I'll make an analogy with that. It's like you're not wearing your glasses. That's right. And the more I close it, the more blurry he gets and uh, until it is really, really uh, almost indistinguishable what, what's happening there. Okay. So there we see that the, the, what's near here gives us the, 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 the rough, the, the, like the rough parts, the, the, the general features, while what's out here is the detail. And that's a general property of Fourier transforms. Um, OK. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of versions of this. Uh, let's see if this one works better. No. OK, it's calculating something. And here, I'm going to show both Mr. Fresnel and Mr. Fourier. In a bit of time. There they are. So I have a slider here. If I, and if I if I'm here, Fourier is on this side, Fresnel is on this side. If I go all the way to the other side, they switch. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mix on each side. So I'm gonna on the Fourier space, I'm gonna put a circle, and outside of that circle, I'm going to put the Fourier transform of one of them, and inside, the part of the Fourier transform of the other one. So that at some point, uh, so if, if, if I'm in the extremes, is when this circle is very big, so on each side I only have the Fourier transform of one, and the other one is when, uh, on the extremes when it's very small. But uh, if I go somewhere in between, okay. This still looks a lot like uh, one of them. But if I start going down here, uh, 
at some point something interesting happens. I think this is probably it. Okay, so I don't know if you remember who they are, but who's this guy? Fourier. The, the, Fourier is a guy with the, like the, the least, the not so thin guy, and Fresnel is the thin guy. Okay, let me come near where you are. You see, so everyone says Fourier is on the left and, and Fresnel is on the right. Let me go a tiny little bit further down. Still the same, isn't it? Now squint, do this. Sorry? We're doing a low-pass filter. No, they're not switching yet. At some point, when you do that, they switch. Go up down a little bit more. No, ah, no, I had to go up, sorry. So now, if you, if you close your eyes a little bit, then all of a sudden, this is, Fourier, this is Fourier and this is Fresnel, isn't it? Even afford to do a tiny little bit more. I went too far. So why is that? How can we do that change that when we see it like this, is one, but when we do this or remove our glasses, it switches. What's happening there? Another way of doing this is, let me, uh, if I come here and I grab this, I cannot do that. I'll show you another version of this. But why do we see one of them when we are looking at it clearly and then when we look at it uh, without our glasses or doing this, it switches? What happens when we do this? We are blurring things. So we're filtering out the high frequencies. And since the high frequency information contains information about one of them, that is a fine detail that dominates our brain when we see it. But when we remove it, then all we have is the other one. So I'll show you another version of this later that works a bit better. OK. Let's do it now. So, do you know this famous musician? So, so, so who? What's his name? It's Professor Niemela, who opened, who, who gave the inauguration of this school. Uh, so he's a saxophone player. I'm sure you will see him play saxophone in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I'm going to use poor Joe as my. Uh, that's my uh, experiment. So, so just to illustrate how I use the Fourier transforms, here is Joe. I just cut a square around him, and I'm doing the zero padding that I was saying. So I put a lot of zeros around, around him. And here I define the Fourier transform. So uh, I, I, I define these this commands rearrange and inverse rearrange that put things in the right order for me to do the, the, the numerical Fourier transform. And then I define, because Fourier in Mathematica doesn't do that, I define my Fourier, my version of Fourier, as doing this your arrangement, doing the Fourier transform, and then uh, fixing it again. So just to show how that rearrangement works, if I apply that to poor Joe, it, I break it into four pieces, and, uh, and it's reorganized the way that I needed to do the Fourier transform. So those, that's Joe's Fourier transform. And again, it's dominated by this line and this line because of the, of the frame. Yes? Uh, yes. So the discrete Fourier transform, uh, let me come back here.
So when we do uh, discrete Fourier transforms, that's exactly here, that's good. Uh, the, this numerical approximation to the Fourier transform goes from zero to n minus one, it's a sum. And we have to make it, so, so it wants the first value, the central value, the origin to be the first point. And then it keeps going and then what's to the left, you have to remove it and put it on the right so that you do the Fourier transform. So in order to do numerically an approximation of the Fourier transform, n is the number of samples. Yes, yes. So what happens is that to do the Fourier transform, uh, you have your sample function here and you want this to be at the center uh, in, in the screen to be the, 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 the main, uh, the central point. So you have to break this into two parts and you have to, here it is. You have to take all this half and move it to the other side. So, so instead of having this function, it looks something like this. So this is the, the center here, then you have some zeros and then the other part. That's something you have to do to approximate the Fourier transform with a numerical algorithm. That's in one dimension. In two dimensions, uh, let me skip here, you have function like this, and again, you have to break it like this, you have to break it like this, and then this quadrant has to be here, this quadrant has to be here, and, and, and like that. So something you have to do, you, you do that rearrangement, then you Fourier transform with the, the command, and then you undo this arrangement, you put it back together. Uh, if you're using MATLAB, it does it for you. I think if you give it the right command. But it's good to, to know that that happens, that that is a necessary step to do the numerical approximation of the Fourier transform. So uh, here I'm, I can do the same thing that I did before. I can calculate, I can put a filter around the Fourier transform of Joe to filter different uh, parts of different levels of detail. And so if I remove um, more and more high frequencies, you start getting uh, this. And this is very similar, as we will see, to what happens in an imaging system when we have a finite pupil. But when we're using coherent illumination, if this were some sample or something that we were illuminating with a laser, and we're using that laser light as a light for imaging, because there's full correlation between all the, the, the lights coming from different parts, uh, then they interfere. And as a result of interference, we see, uh, I didn't switch. What? Okay. There we go. Uh, we see these fringes here. So these are not curtains, these are, this is interference that we're seeing when, uh, because of coherent effects. So if I, oh, sorry, they are curtains. Uh, but if, but we, we can see some interference effects, some, some fringes that form. If we're doing incoherent imaging that we will talk about later, those are not there. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to show the same effect. And I needed another person playing the saxophone, so I found John Coltrane on the web, a uh, famous saxophone player. And and again, we can mix Joe with John Coltrane. So who's that? Coltrane or, or, or Joe Mella? If you look at the face. Looks more like Coltrane, especially if I make this big. But if I make it small, it starts becoming uh, Niemela, so that's Niemela, Niemela, Niemela. Then all of a sudden it starts being Coltrane. So why when I make it small, does it become uh, Joe? What's happening now? 
Sorry? It's a low-pass filter because we have our pupils that are, and when I scale it down, the high frequencies become much higher, and they start not being perceptible by us. Uh, so there, the high frequencies that have John Coltrane's information are not making it, uh, but uh, I have to make it this very big so that we, we can start seeing John Coltrane's face. Okay. So high frequencies have the, the fine detail, and low frequencies uh, have the general uh, structure. Very good. Now, so we discuss the Fourier structure when, whenever we apply it to a system that's linear shift invariant, the, the Fourier space has a meaning. And in the case of uh, optics, uh, we know what uh, that is. So that has to do with plane wave propagation. So if this is the axis of propagation, Z, this is the transverse axis, X, and I have some initial distribution here. Uh, I can break that this way into different waves, so into different frequency components. So I can have a frequency component like this. But now, this has a meaning because this, for a given frequency component, is uh, is a slice of a plane wave propagating in some direction. The period of the, the, the of the plane wave is something fixed. It's, let's say lambda is this much. So I need to have some, some sort of plane wave with wavefronts at this distance, such that if I put it here and I rotate it, it fits with that. So it has to go through this point, and then this point, and this, this point. The maxima have to be here, and here, and here. Well, I can see if I take that, put it here, and I rotate it, all of a sudden it's going to click when, let's say, this is in traveling in this direction. At this side, uh, oops. At this angle, even though this is fixed, lambda, when I do it at that angle, this spacing corresponds to the period of that uh, spatial frequency. On the other uh, hand, if I had something that goes more like, like this, faster, would correspond to what angle, higher or smaller? More, more going more that way, or going more that way? The distance is fixed, and I have to take that, put it here, and rotate it until whoop, it clicks. So, so there's a maximum here, a maximum here, a maximum here. Is it going at a larger angle or a smaller angle? It's larger. Yeah, remember, larger because this is the, the axis of propagation, so it has to be... Something like that. Or if I had something like this, a bit, oh, that looks exactly the same. Let me just draw the points here. So if I have something like this, then at what angle is that going? The, the propagation. So the propagation is perpendicular to the wavefronts. So this, where these are more space, is going at this angle. When this is less space, it's more rapid. I have to tilt this more so that these wavefronts fit with these oscillations. This is going very fast, so I have to tilt it a lot. It's almost going perpendicular to it. So let me now turn this around. If I had something that goes d directly in that direction, what is the frequency of oscillation here? How many, how fast does this oscillate, or how slow? If I want a wave that is not going like this, but it's going like that, doesn't oscillate because it's going 
if it's going like this, the wavefronts are like that, and these never cross this point. So this is corresponds to the, the DC component, no oscillation. So we can see that these frequencies now are each mapped with a different angle of oscillation. Yes. Ah, okay. Is that clear? Any questions? One more. What happens if my things are spaced like this? So I have a frequency that is so fast that the spacing between these things is very, very close. The spacing is closer than lambda. At what angle am I propagating? Like this. But if I put this like this, if I put it like this and I put these wavefronts like this, that's not even close, it's, it's not even fine enough to, to match those points. So what is what are we talking about then? Those evanescent waves. So so when we had this this uh, simulation here, that's precisely what I was trying to show. If we come here, um, let's say I do this. I'm going to show you a different version. So this is the same thing. So this this curve that I'm drawing here is the red curve that we see here, and that's the wave, so that's the z direction. But if I tilt it somehow, when it's going at some angle, then this intersection is oscillating slowly. If I tilt, uh, tilt it more, it's, it's going at a large angle now, and it's oscillating faster. And then it's going at a very, very large angle, it's like this case here, so it's oscillating much faster. But then if we force it to oscillate faster than that, it cannot do it as a traveling wave. It has to become an evanescent wave that decays. So it is, yeah, in this case, it's going in this direction, but it's also decaying exponentially in this direction. And the faster it oscillates, the faster it decays. It just decays very quick. So those are the waves that just don't, cannot carry any, any information. And the same if I go in the other direction. So if I go now in the other direction, it goes like that. So, um, so now there is a, a natural meaning for the Fourier transform, which is, she just a dry eraser. So I have this Fourier variable, I called it nu, and it's just 1 over lambda, uh, u sub x, u sub y, where these are the coordinates of a unit vector that tells me in what direction I'm propagating. So if I take my, the blackboard is not big enough to use my arm, so I'm going to have to use my pen. So if I put here, I have a circle. like this. So this is the Fourier domain. Let's say this is uh, nu sub x, nu sub y. And then I can see that if I have, I do the Fourier transform and I have a point here, this point, whatever that is, corresponds to something physical, which is a wave that is traveling in what direction from with respect to here. Well, I just put this pen here, and I put it such that the shadow, the projection of the tip, is falling into that point, and that tells me the direction in which that component of the light is going. So this corresponds to light going that way, while this corresponds to light going in that way. Where should I draw the point of something going in that direction? You tell me when I'm right. Yeah, there. Something like this. This would, the, the projection of this would go in this direction. 
So in this Fourier space, all the interior of the uh, of, of this circle would correspond to what? To waves that travel far away, because I can always take my unit vector and put it in a position where the, the projection, this back here, gives me a direction of propagation. What is this point here, outside? Well, there's nothing I can do with my pen to have its, its, its tip go here, because I would need to do the, the z component of my pen be imaginary, and I cannot do that with my pen. Uh, so if I could somehow rotate it such that the, this part of my pen were imaginary, then I could stretch this all the way, and that would give me an evanescent wave that is traveling in this direction and is decaying uh, uh, as I propagate away. So everything outside of this circle is evanescent waves. Everything inside of the circle is traveling waves. So in the Fourier domain, there's a clear meaning. Uh, we go from, uh, we go to a representation where each point tells you a direction of propagation, particularly if we're inside of the circle. So there's a clear meaning. Uh, the Fourier space gives direction of propagation. Did that make sense? OK. So Fourier, again, has a meaning. So I, w as we say, in, in sound, because our ears are more or less linear shift invariant, frequency, the Fourier space frequency, is tone, something we perceive. In paraxial optics, monochromatic optics propagating, not paraxial, sorry, monochromatic optics, because also free space, as some medium of propagation is linear and shift invariant, if I move, is the same, then the Fourier space has to have a meaning, and the meaning is directions of propagation. So this tells me this plane wave going in that direction, this plane wave going in this direction. So let's go back and think about the uncertainty relation that we discussed before. So what happens if, if I focus a beam? So I have a beam, it's focused like this. It's going in that direction. And if I look at this slice here, let's say. So it's going in the C direction, X direction. So the, the cross section here is, uh, is something like this, some maximum. What is delta X in this case? From, with the point of view of the uncertainty relation. It tells me about what's width. It tells me about the width of the intensity on this. On this. So it tells me about this, this, this width here. Delta x is how small that dot is. But what about delta nu? Delta nu, nu now is in one direction, let's say nu x, let me say, nu x is u x divided by lambda. So this is the same as delta x, delta u sub x divided by lambda. But what is u sub x here? The u is a vector that tells you the direction of propagation. So the width in u is the width in direction. So I have a beam that has all a bunch of direction of propagations, directions of propagation, but is sort of constrained to a cone. So you can think of as having this angle here, and let me call this delta theta, and really what I have is uh, what is the relation between theta and u sub x. Uh, I have a sign of the angle because if I'm if I if I have this going in this direction, so u is zero. I'm I'm here. The angle is zero, I, and I go to one when the angle is ninety degrees. So I have a sign. A projection onto the screen is a sign. 
So, u of x in this sense is the sine of the x. So, this is delta x delta sine of x, sine of theta, sorry, divided by lambda. And if we're in the paraxial approximation where angles are small, sine of theta and theta are more or less the same. But the uncertainty principle tells me that this is greater or equal than 1 over 4 uh, pi. So therefore, delta x times delta sine theta is greater and equal than lambda divided by 4 pi. So what is the meaning of this? Resolution, once more, is another way of seeing resolution. Because the smaller I make my dot, the bigger I have to make the, the angle, the cone angle of the beam. Conversely, if I want to do laser communications, for example, if I want to send a signal far away, what do I want to uh, a small? Which one I want? Which one of these two things I want to be small? The angle. You want a very, very collimated beam, so I need this. What do I need to do for that? Because of this inequality, if I want to make this very small, uh, sorry, here, if I want to make this very small, I have to make this large because the product cannot be smaller than that. So I have to make my beam big. So there is a balance. You cannot have a very th thin beam that is very narrow. You just can't. So for a given angle, for a given angle, uh, you, you can have a minimum size here. And that has to do with resolution, as we, as we will see. So if I have, um, if I'm illuminating a spot and I want to make it as small as possible, what are the only two degrees of freedom that I have? So I want this to be small, so what can I do? I can make this big or I can make this small. I cannot change for pi, so I have to change lambda for this. So I can increase the angle make a, a, wider, uh, a bigger uh, cone of light, a big, as we say, a bigger numerical aperture. Or I can go uh, to smaller wavelengths. And that's why people change from CDs to, to Blu-ray. That, that lets you, you're just making a, using a smaller lamp. Does that, that make sense? Of course, when I, uh, when I make this angle bigger, another thing that you do is there's another characteristic, which is the depth of focus. So how this is really a, a blob here of light. And for some applications, we want this to be as small and this also to be as small as possible because that's the longitudinal resolution if I want to do 3D imaging. So for some applications, this is very good to have a very narrow depth of focus. For others, it is not. For example, in photography, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. If, if I want to take a photo of you guys that is very sharp, I use a camera with a big lens. But then one of your, or a row of you is going to be very sharp, and the people in the row behind and the row be, uh, in front are going to be blurry. And sometimes that's nice, like if you take a photo of a crowd and you want to highlight the person, like there's mm, a, a bicycle race or something and there's uh, the famous racer in the middle and you want to focus on that person, everyone else blurry, uh, then uh, that's good. But if you want a photograph that where everyone looks good, then that's bad. So, so there's a trade-off between having uh, very good resolution laterally and very good resolution longitudinally. Yes. Yes, it's the depth of focus. So sometimes you want a long depth of focus, sometimes you want a very short one. Because uh, when you're imaging, for example, a 3D biological sample, you might want to go into the, into, into, into the, the sample and image different, uh, different depths. And there, if there's some stuff here, 
because the, the beam is so extended, you don't see it, especially if you're using nonlinear techniques where you focus a lot of light to excite the, 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 the matter there to, to emit light in the different wavelength, then you really want to concentrate the intense regions to as small as possible re, uh, po uh, regions here. I knew some people that uh, had a project of designing uh, barcode scanners, for example, and that's uh, an interesting trade-off where this plays a role. Because uh, if you, so you have uh, your bar uh, barcode tags, and and there's separation. You have a laser that scans this, and you want it, the laser to fit into the dark and light so that it can read the, the barcode. So that means that for your laser at the focal point, you want the spot to be as narrow as possible so you can read the barcode. But if your barcode is going to be used not only in the supermarket, but it's uh, for uh, storing things in a, in a, like in a warehouse or something, uh, then the person in the, in, in the warehouse is, is working with a reader, a gun, and they just point it at the tag and, and, and read it. But you, often you have stacks of boxes. So there's a box here with its tag, then one with the tag, then one with the tag. So you don't want to get a stair, uh, like a ladder every time to go and read all the box. You just want to point your gun and, and get the reading. So that means that while you want delta x to be small, you also want delta theta to be small because you don't want your beam to spread too quickly. So that is the type of design situation where you're fighting against this or you're trying to look for the compromise that lets you, uh, over a region of distances, have this be good enough uh, while uh, uh, at all distances, not only at the center. Okay. Very good. So, um, So because these correspond to plane waves uh, going in different directions, uh, and we have that the plane wave, e to the i, uh, let me write it as k u dot r. I can write this as e to the i k u x x plus u y y, and then I separate the part in C, e to the i, k, u, z times z. What we did last time is say, okay, if I separate this way, this looks like the part that I need to define the Fourier transform. This is what matches the, the, these oscillations in the initial field. And this part is how this accumulates an extra phase uh, when I go, say, from if I had one of these like this, so initially it reproduces this, this, this oscillation here, but as I go far away, this oscillation, if I do another slice, it's gonna look the same, but it's shifted. And that shift comes from a factor of the phase that I accumulated as propagating from this distance to this distance. And this is precisely the transfer function. So we do the Fourier transform, then we see how much longitudinal phase we accumulated, and then we reconstruct it. So that's how we, 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 we model the Fourier transform. Where this u, u sub c has to be defined as the square root of one minus what? Remember the vector u satisfies this property, it's a unit vector. So this is ux squared plus uy squared plus uz squared. So uz is equal to one minus. And we use this when, when ux squared plus uy squared is less or equal to one. Otherwise we use i. If this is bigger than this, then we have to use ux squared plus u y squared minus one if u x squared plus u y squared is greater than one. So 
So this thing here is then the famous uh, transfer function. If I come back to Joe, where's Joe? Before I do that, let me just mention something. Are there any questions? Is it, is, am I going too fast? Yes, Anna. lesson is every scientist you talk to has their own notation. <laughs> so we have to be fluent in, in, in see past the names and of the letters and, 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 and go to the, the meaning of the letters. Uh, so yes. So ah here I have a drink. So in this Fourier space, then this center is the propagating wave. So these are the parts of the signal when we do the Fourier transform that manage to travel far away. Well, all this stuff outside is the stuff with the very high detail that doesn't manage to travel far away because it's evanescent waves. So even free space is a low pass filter when we're propagating because the high frequencies are lost. Now, many, in many cases, when we have, for example, a laser, laser pointer or something, what, what, and suppose that I have a laser pointer going directly into the C direction. The Fourier transform of, o, over the transverse plane of that laser pointer that is very directional lives where in this Fourier space? So close to the center. It only has components that are going over a very small range of angles. So it's a very directional thing. So this small region here is called the paraxial uh, region. It's the region of very small angles because I'm only using plane waves that have a very small angle with respect to the z-axis, which is coming out of the board. Uh, so the paraxial region say that ux and uy are small, let's say uh, much less than 1. And in that case, we can approximate uz, which is the square root of 1 minus ux squared minus uy squared as 1. Uh, what is the next correction to this when we have, let's say, something like this. One minus something very small, square root. Anyone remembers what? So this is very small. If it's extremely small, then one is good. But we need a little bit more. Over two. And that's the paraxial approximation. So we just approximate this as that. So the last formula we wrote last time then is if we have the field at x comma y comma z, how can I model the propagation of this field? I have to go to the Fourier space, so I'm going to start from the left. I have to do the Fourier transform of the field at 
at the plane 0, x comma y, when x goes to new x, y goes to new y, then what do I do to that? You multiply by the transfer function. And then, what else, what else do I do? The inverse Fourier transform. Where this transfer function is precisely this e to the i k c this u of c that I mentioned before. And it can be the non-paraxial or the paraxial version. And, and that's it. That gives us the, the, the propagation of the field. So, so this is the signal. And this is the response. So this is the standard linear system where to model propagation, I can do a Fourier transform, multiply by something, inverse Fourier transform. So I'm going to do that here uh, with uh, Joe. Uh, in, I'm going to use the paraxial approximation just for simplicity, but it's just as easy to do the exact. So what I have here is I define something that I call a chirp, which is just a table of the sum of the squares of new x and new y. And then the transfer function is e to the i 2 pi uh, times the chirp. And because I had to divide by lambda, I, I, I put a 2 pi square. It's 2 pi all squared divided by 2, so it's 2 pi squared. So then Joe propagation is this. So I'm taking Joe Fourier transform multiplication by the transfer function inverse Fourier transform. Initially, z is 0. So what happens to the transfer function? is 1. So I'm taking the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. Mod square, I recover yo. But as we start moving away, we see uh, that things start to, to form. And we get something very, well, look, would look almost exactly like we would do if we had a laser that is nicely collimated. We printed a transparency of Joe, illuminated that transparency, and then put our detector at different distances. It would def light would diffract like this. So it's, it's, it's Fresnel diffraction. Fraunhofer diffraction is what happens when you go very far away. And in that case, what you see is just the Fourier transform, which is what Professor Consortini is going to show you in the lab. If you go very, very far, and, and the logic for this is um, the following. So if I have z and x, as we said, I have some object. I can break it into waves that are going in different directions. So let's say this one here, and another one that is going here, and another one that is going here. And I continue. I, I mix all these waves in such a way that they reproduce what we want here. But as they propagate, they mix in different ways, creating different patterns, which is what we're seeing here. If we go very, very, very far away, you can sort of imagine that at this point, only this wave got there. And at this point, only this wave got there, etc. So very far, we just separate the different Fourier components. And essentially, we see the Fourier transform. And what happens here very far is precisely this Fraunhofer diffraction, where we see is essentially the mod square, the amplitude square of the Fourier transform. But near to the object, we're more into the Fresnel regime, where we see uh, mixtures, different mixtures of the different waves, given different behaviors. Okay. So I, I don't 
let this slide very far, but if I go, if I could keep going, at some point this would become more or less the Fourier transform. Does that make sense? So modeling propagation is very easy numerically. You just do a Fourier transform in two dimensions, multiplication by a simple thing, inverse Fourier transform. That's it. Now, when we're talking about uh, the systems we had, uh, so if we have a, a system and I have a signal and a response, I said a way to model this is the Fourier transform, then so I have S tilde, then here uh, the response is just the multiplication of S tilde with the transfer function and then inverse Fourier transform. This is a, a diagram that we drew uh, in one of the previous cases. So this is a linear shift invariant system, like free space or, or many others. But there's an, a direct way to go from here to here without doing Fourier transforms. What is that? The, sorry? The impulse response, which is, um, yeah, it's just a convolution. So I can go here saying that the response is the convolution of the signal with a point spread function. Where the point spread function uh, the, sorry, the impulse response sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> the impulse response is related how to the point, to the transfer function. Is the inverse Fourier transform of the transfer function. It's just the inverse Fourier transform of the transfer function. Well, the same must be true here. The impulse response is the, Fourier tr the inverse Fourier transform of this transfer function. So even in free propagation, we have that the impulse response of x comma y comma z is the, in the inverse Fourier transform of mu x going to x, mu y going to y of e to the i k g this u sub c where u sub c is given by this expression. Now, this calculation happens to have a closed form expression that is very hard to get. So most co courses just avoid it because it's, it's very difficult to get it. But there's, there's a way to do it. And the result happens to be uh, very intuitive. It gives minus 1 over 2 pi, a spherical wave, e to the i, k, square root of x squared plus y squared plus c squared, divided by x squared plus y squared plus c squared. What is the name of this thing here? A spherical wave. And we get, actually we get the derivative in c of that as it turns out. So you can expand this. It has two terms, and oftentimes one is much bigger than the other, and you drop that one. But uh, this is the exact result. And it turns out that this z derivative of the spherical wave is very much like the spherical wave itself, times an obliquity factor. And what this tells you is that in this impulse response regime, if I have propagation from a field here, each point in this field is behaving like a spherical wave emanating from there. So this is here. So if I want to see the field here, this point would get blurred because what was coming out of this point is now a, a, a wave that is very extended. Then what is coming out of this point is also getting blurred because it's, it's another very extended wave. What's coming out of this point is another very extended wave. So we have to blur 
each point in the object with a spherical wave that is coming out from that point. And that's what causes that blurring, that the, the image to be like that. What is the name that we also always associate with this idea? Huygens, the Huygens principle, that each point in the object becomes, can be thought of as a source of a spherical wave coming with it. It's not exactly as a spherical wave, it has this extra thing, but it's like a spherical wave. So this Huygens principle is fully consistent with this image. This is the impulse response. And the point spread function, this, which is this phase propagation of the plane wave, is the transfer function. So when we think of propagation in terms of Fourier transforms, we're naturally thinking about plane waves. When we're thinking of propagation in terms of convolutions, we're naturally thinking about spherical-like waves. And there's a, a mathematical connection between the two. Yes. No, it's, this one is exact, and this one's the hard one. Thank you. If you use the paraxial approximation, then it's easy, because it's all about integrals with Gaussians. And what you get is the paraxial approximation of this one, which is where you also expand this square root, the derivative, you only keep one term. And, uh, and this one, actually, you just approximate a C, the, the one downstairs. So the paraxial approximation is, uh, is much easier. And that's what gives the Fresnel formula. If you use the exact, actually, this is called the Rayleigh-Sommerfeld 1 formula. There are two Rayleigh-Sommerfeld formulas. The other one is sort of useless. But uh, Rayleigh-Sommerfeld 1 is this one with this propagator. And it's exact. The, the paraxial approximation, when you use this, before taking this inverse Fourier transform, that's easy. And that gives you the Fresnel uh, propagation formula. OK, so in the last half hour, I'm going to leave, stop, stop thinking only about free space and thinking about what happens when you have a more complicated system. Any more questions about this? Okay. So what happens if I'm propagating through a system that also has lenses? Okay, another lens here. How would you model this? Yeah, so, so we know that a lens does a Fourier transform, and that's how I'm going to do it for the interest of time now. But, uh, but rigorously, what you would do is just start with your field here. You say use the Fourier transform angular spectrum plane wave propagation that we described. So Fourier transform multiplication by transform function, inverse Fourier transform, to take you here. Then you have the field, and you know that a lens gives you a phase. So it doesn't change the amplitude much, but it transmits a phase to the field. So then once you calculate the field there, you multiply it by the phase of the lens. It's a quadratic phase. Then you Fourier transform again. You propagate all the way here. You convert back to the field. Then you multiply it by this new phase, and then you propagate again. So, so you're sort of jumping between real space and Fourier space. Fourier space is very good for propagating. Real space is very good for applying masks, like a lens or an aperture or something. And this is, well, w the extreme of this is what is called a split step method, where you go also jumping from one to the other. When you're doing, for example, nonlinear propagation, where some effects are easy to describe in Fourier space, some in, in real space, you have to be jumping from one to the other, jump to the other. You, you go to one, you multiply by something, you come to the other one, you multiply by something. So free space propagation is easy to go to Fourier space, multiply by transfer function, and come back. 
and then a lens is better to just stay with the field and multiply it by a phase function. However, that's not what we're going to do. Suppose that I have a system where this is a focal length, so let me use my curly F, and a focal length here, and then I have another one here, and another one here. If I just look at the first one, I know that the properties of lenses from ray optics is that if I come out from this point, on the other side of the lens, all the rays are going to have what? Parallel rays. And the direction of these rays depends on the direction of this or on the position? Positions. Positions. If I take this, all the rays are going to come in some direction. If I come here, all the rays are going to go in this direction. So a lens is sort of translating positions into directions, which is going, is like doing a Fourier transform because the Fourier transform of position is direction. When you do a Fourier transform of the transfer position of a field, you get a distribution in directions. So going from this plane to this plane, you're sort of exchanging what is position and what is direction. The lens is doing that for you. Because also, if I had directions here, if I have a bunch of rays with the same direction, they're all going to go to the same position. So there's this exchange between position and direction. And that's why it is a Fourier transforming object. So when I start from here, uh, I can think of a, a system that forms images um, because, uh, as, as this so-called 4F system because from a point we go to directions and this takes directions back into positions. And any imaging system is a complicated version of this. But this is the canonical picture for thinking of an imaging system, if you want. And usually, because lenses are not perfect, in this intermediate space, we have something called the pupil, something that limits which, what light gets through the system and what light doesn't. So, so if I have some object here, and I'm going to measure something here, essentially what I have to think as uh, of course, this is going to be upside down, but if I, if I were to reverse my coordinates on, on this one, let's say, uh, I can think of this as doing a Fourier transform, multiplication by an aperture, and inverse Fourier transform. And roughly, that is what any optical system is doing. Of course, this focal distance here, in practice, is going to be very different than this focal distance here, and that's why we get magnification and all these things. But just to understand the effects of resolution, we can, we can simply uh, see, uh, understand it through this. So the aperture here is very important because it limits what? It limits the aberration, which is going to be the next thing we're going to be discussing. But suppose that there are no aberrations. The spectrum. If we have the object here, here we have the Fourier transform. So it's like, like this case over here. If, did I remove it? Um, where, not this one. So if I limit that pupil, the image start getting worse and worse. Because remember, what I did here is precisely take the Fourier transform, put an aperture that only lets some of the light go through, and then inverse Fourier transform. So the resolution of my image is going to be seriously affected by, by this. Now, the key geometrical argument is here, what range of directions here would make it through the system? Because different directions here, as we said, correspond to different spatial frequencies, to different fine or, or short detail. Yes? No frequencies. No, no frequencies? Low frequencies. Low frequencies will get. 
but can you tell me which one is the limiting one? Yeah, so this one, I would say, is probably not going to get through the system. This one is probably going to get through the system. There's a geometric way in which you can tell me exactly which one is the last one that is going to get through the system. Yes, and because we're at the focal plane here, that's, let me start from here and walk backwards. So I start with this ray, and this is going to bend in what direction? So that's the direction, the limiting direction. Everything he going here is going to go and get through. Everything here is not going to get through. So I can clearly see that there's this cone here that is the one that gets through. And that gives me the range of frequencies uh, that of the object that are going to be transmitted onto, onto, the, onto the other hand. What is the name of this, uh, the sign of this angle? It's the numerical aperture. And that's going to determine the resolution of the system. Because once we get this way, our images are not going to be a delta function. They're going to be some, some, some pattern uh, of this type. And it's a calculation that we did already. So if I have a point here, and I have a point here, um, and this forms another image, then uh, sometimes we can distinguish those, and sometimes we can't. And that sets the resolution limit. So to, to see the, so we can see the point spread function on the detector, which is what we measure. But it's sometimes illustrative to think of the point spread function here on the object, which is sort of, if I were to reverse things, the size of the blob of light here, the very intense blob of light. Uh, that if I were to eliminate this direction, I would have. Because by seeing how much that overlaps with other ones, that gives me the limit of fundamental uh, resolution that is independent of how much I'm magnifying. So by just looking at this, this cone of, of, of waves that are coming here and how focused they are, that tells me, yeah, this, this voxel, if, I, if you will, of, of light is very small or very big, and how much it overlaps with the neighbors. And that sets up the resolution. I cannot form independent images of something here or something here if their, their volumes uh, coincide. So, so we're going to do the calculation of this, and this, uh, this gives us the, the, the resolution. So if I flip this, and I have a lens. and I have this focus field here, how do I calculate this, this wave? So I have all the plane waves are transmitted. So I have an, uh, an integral. And I have e to the i k u dot r d u x d u y. So all these plane waves. Each one of these arrows is really a plane wave. And they're all making it here. But this integral should be limited to what? Remember, the u's, uh, ux and uy, are the components of the unit vector telling me the direction of the wave. So this is a unit vector telling me the direction is the, the x component. Let's say the y component's out of the board. The c component is the longitudinal one. and um, but what I want is that the, the maximum angle that they can form is the numerical aperture. So I need ux squared plus uy squared to be what? Bigger than something or smaller than something? S smaller than what? One, that's if we would have all a numerical aperture of one. Let me 
make it easy, I put a square root. This is the Na. So the numerical aperture is like the sine of the angle, is like the transverse component of this. Uh, assuming that we're, that the refractive index is one. If the refractive index is not one, then we have to scale this. So, so this is when we, if we happen to put all waves here, uh, such that they're all in phase at this point, uh, and they're all in equal amounts, I have to solve this integral. And this will tell me as a function of space uh, the, the field amplitude for, for, for this blob of light. This integral cannot be solved in closed form, unfortunately. Except, but we can do the transverse slice and the longitudinal uh, slice. And those are good enough to get an idea of what happens. So, so let's do that. So, So this then is uh, e to the i q u x times x plus u y times y d u x d u y. Given that the region is circular, do you think it's a good idea to use Cartesian components? Here I'm doing in terms of ux and uy. We should go to polar. It's better to go to polar. So if I say ux comma uy is equal to some u transverse, let's say, times cosine of theta, uh, of phi, sorry, u transverse sine phi, then this becomes the integral of e to the i k um, and and same with with x comma y I, I I let me say this is uh, rho cosine and we're using theta already so let me use uh, I don't know curly phi rho sine curly phi then what is this dot product? This times this plus this times this gives me u transverse rho, and then cosine times cosine plus sine times sine. What? Cosine of phi minus phi, d phi, d, uh, uh, u transverse, d u transverse. And the integral in phi goes from where to where? zero to two pi, because this is the angle, not, not, it's not this angle, it's the angle around here. And this one here goes from zero to the Na. What is this integral here? A Bessel function, we, we solved that uh, yesterday, yesterday? I'm lo losing track of time now. Uh, so this is 2 pi integral from 0 to Na, the Bessel function of whatever sitting here, k u transverse rho u transverse d u transverse. And then uh, we use a property of special functions when we solve this. So yesterday we used the method of using properties. Today we're going to use the method of laziness and asking Mathematica. So, this also works. Not always. Mathematica makes mistakes. I, I, I've discovered a few recently. So, into, uh, it's too small. Integrate Bessel J order zero, comma K U Rho 
comma u comma from zero uh, in integrate that in u from zero to n a. Come on. <laughs> This is probably correct, but it's not not what I want. Why is this doing this? What if I just say you? you? Okay. So, are there any mathematicians here? Good. I can tell you a joke. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. There's a group of optic physics, optics people like us that we, we come all to the Winter College and then we go on an excursion somewhere in the field. And, uh, and, and it turns out that they put us in a hot air balloon and we go flying and all that, but then the wind comes, blows us somewhere in the middle of nowhere and the balloon comes down and we're lost. We don't know where we are. And, and, and there's no one and then we see someone walking and, uh, and, and say, excuse me, sir, can you tell us where we are? And the guy is carrying like books and has a hat and he looks at us and you are in the basket of a balloon. And then you say, you're a mathematician, aren't you? Like, yes, how did you know? You gave us an answer that is absolutely correct and completely useless. <laughs> <laughs> so Mathematica in this case gave me an answer that is absolutely correct <laughs> and completely useless. <laughs> Well, what this gives you, I'll, I'll just jump to the result. J1 is proportional, I might miss the constants, J1 K N A times uh, rho divided by K N A times rho. And this is the famous uh, the famous um, um, airy pattern. <coughs> and um, normally, what we see is not this, but but what? Because this is this a function can be positive or negative. This is the field. So what we see is the mod square of this. So, so what we would see in the detector, if I have the lens, the aperture, the lens here, what I would see is something like this, which is precisely the mod of J1 K N A rho divided by K N A rho mod square. this. So, so in fact, um, so OTF So, um, so the plot of that is one of the blue curves here. Now, suppose that we have two objects, and each one is forming its point first function. But they're separated by some amounts. Uh, just look at the plot actually on the, on the, on the right. And it, it suppose that each one is being illuminated by a source that is completely unrelated. So, so the, the, the light is, the face of the light coming from one of the objects is not related to the other one. Then what would, should we add the field contribution of each one of them and then take the modulus square? Or should we add the intensities of each one? Yeah, you add the intensities because you, really we should add the fields. But 
the field of one in time might be going out of phase with the field of the other quickly. So when I add the two fields, then I take the modulus square, I'm going to have the intensity of this, the intensity of this, and a cross term. And that cross term is going to change a lot in time. Something's going to be positive, something's going to be negative, and it's going to average out to zero. Uh, so we don't see it. So for incoherent imaging, when we're illuminating with incoherent light, or when we have something like fluorescence, that the emission from one molecule is incoherent, is not, on, is not related to the, the, the light from the other, then what we should do is add the intensities of these area patterns. And, and, and the Rayleigh criterion tells us that we're going to be able to see the sum, something like this. If I see this black curve, which is the sum of those two, I can know that there are two things. And maybe I can even do better than that. If, even, even if they're a bit closer, I can see that there are two things. But it's not so clear, especially when you have noise and pixelation and all these things. It gets difficult. Uh, if they're very close, definitely it looks like just one black curve. But, if, it, but they're, if they're very far away, then it's very clear that there are two things. So the Riley criterion is that when the separation is such that the argument of this is 0 0.609, which means that the maximum of this one coincides with the first zero of this one. Let me go back to that case. So if I just run this again. So here, the, the maximum of this one co coincides with the first zero of this one. Then it's clear that you can separate them. Closer, it's a bit dangerous. Further away, it's, it's safer. So it's not like it works, it works, it works, it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's gradual. But you had to put a boundary somewhere and Rayleigh chose, uh, chose 0 0.609. Ray Rayleigh or Abby, they both did it in slightly different ways. So this is the limit on resolution. Now, if, if the two objects were uh, illuminated by the same laser, for example, and their faces were strongly correlated, then we would have more a situation like this on the right. So I have this one and this one. Now I add the fields and take the intensity. And turns out that's worse. You can see that that cross term is hurting us because this is actually, uh, this, we don't see the two humps here. We just see one. Certainly, it's very difficult. Assuming that the two are at this certain distance or, or, prop, or, or situations where the phase coming from both of them is the same. Now, it could be that the phase between them is slightly different, and that's what I'm changing here. If I the phase one with respect to the other, then actually, if they're completely out of phase, is better than the incoherent case. This, this black curve now is, goes even down to zero. So we can really tell very clearly that there are two things. So when we change the phase of one with respect to the other one, the incoherent case, which we have on the right, doesn't care. It's always the same. But the coherent case goes from being quite bad to quite good. And in fact, if I average all possibilities, that's how I get the figure on the right. It's, it's sort of the average of all, all possibilities of in phase and out of phase. Yes? Sorry? Yeah, the Rayleigh criterion. So we're right at the Rayleigh criterion here. It tells me that there's a separation at which I can say, ah, oh, yeah, I can tell there are two. And that's when the separation between, so the separation x2 minus x1 is greater than uh, 0.609. Uh, and this would be divided by k and a. Is that correct, Humberto? Yes. So k is 2 pi divided by lambda. So this is something in terms of lambda. So the bigger the NA, the smaller this, uh, the smaller this number. So the, the the more I can keep these things separated. It, no, this is thought for incoherent illumination. So incoherent. So 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 that in the time of Rayleigh and Abbey, 
because they didn't have lasers, all light was incoherent illumination. So they, they never thought about coherent illumination. They only thought about incoherent illumination. So they only thought about the case on the right. But now that we have microscopes that can use coherent illumination, we need to care about the two cases. But this is just thought for the incoherent illumination. If we have coherent illumination, we, and we manage to engineer the phase between neighboring things to be opposite, then we can do better, much better. But, uh, but we cannot be sure. We can also do much worse if they're in phase. And uh, this boundary where this is exactly 6.9 is the one that I'm showing there as a default. So at the moment, that separation corresponds exactly to the boundary between uh, is, the, is the Rayleigh criterion closer, breaks the Rayleigh criterion further away, uh, satisfies the Rayleigh criterion. So yeah, as we separate this more, clearly that's better. So, so as, as, as Humberto was saying yesterday, uh, so, so what I would see, this is just a slice, but I would see a blob and another blob. And they look like this, and they, sober, they overlap. If I take this image and I take it to the photocopier and make it bigger, well, I'm going to get blob and another blob. I'm not, they're not going to look any more different than this. You cannot get better resolution by just making things bigger because you're also magnifying your point spread functions. So, so what matters is the size of your point spread function. If you increase your NA, for example, then instead of ha the central points are the same, but instead of having that blob, you might have this blob and this blob, and that's quite good. So that's how we increase the solution, by increasing DNA or by doing what to the wavelength? Decreasing the wavelength. And those are the only two things that let us uh, make our focus uh, smaller. Okay, we run out of time. Uh, next time we'll do the other integral, which is what happens uh, longitudinally. Okay. Um, we meet at 11. Uh, do we, do, does, does everyone know about what lab you're going to this afternoon? Group number one with me. Okay. M lab, the, boss, the shuttle will be here, 155. If uh, somebody is not there, we lose the, the boss. Have to be there. Okay, and that's in the next room here. But, but check, are you sitting with you? Uh, yeah. Group three. And number three is Anna. For tomorrow? Uh, number two. Three. <laughs> okay. I am three. <laughs> I know. Okay. For tomorrow, number three with me. And on Friday, number two. Okay. And check. Okay. Now the key question is, do you all know whether you're one, two, or three? Okay, good. All right. So for the ones that are coming with me, I don't have a plan. We, you, I, and that, I do this every year. I, I, I just tell you, what do you want to do? And we'll try to do it. So anything that we've learned in any of the lectures here, we'll try to implement it in mathematics. And we'll all learn together. Okay. Okay, see you at 11. <laughs>